with its seemingly long list of benefits, which includes boosting mood, alleviating pain, promoting healthy sleep and healthy digestion, improving skin conditions, and so many more, it's no wonder people are turning to essential oils to support their health and well-being. The popularity of these wonder-working oils is stirring interest in learning how to extract them for personal use or for business. Welcome to Extraction Essentials, where you'll learn and discover how to create a formula using quality engineered products. Hosted by Tony Frischnecht, this podcast is all about the process of extraction tools and the equipment that surrounds the extraction lab or facility. Create an income while enjoying the many benefits and uses of essential oils by tuning in to Extraction Essentials. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Extraction Essentials. I'm your host, Tony Frisch Connect. I've spent 15 years, a ton of that has been in extraction. And so my guests today are David Ross. He is the founder and COO of Essential Extractions. And I also have Gary Ross. He is the founder and CEO of Essential Extraction. So guys, thank you so much for joining me today. We have a fun show up for everybody. I'm excited about the show. We're going to be talking about vaporizer cartridge history. And if those of you out there that have not, are not familiar with vaporizer cartridges, it's where it all got started. And so this is going to be fun for me because uh, David and Gary have, has, have extensial knowledge in this area. They've got about eight years, so close to a decade in working with these, these products and, and this hardware. Gary, welcome to the show. David, how are you doing today, guys? Hey, doing Tony. great. Nice to see you, Tony. Yeah, you too. Hey, thanks so much for joining me today. This is an exciting one for me because, like I mentioned, there's so much that has happened over the last decade with the cartridge. Uh, you know, the invention of the vaporizer, I believe, was in the mid-90s uh, by a gentleman out of Asia. His name escapes my mind at this point, but uh, I won't go too far into that. Guys, where did you guys begin working with cartridges? What happened? What, what pulled you into that direction? Good, good question, Tony. I'll start. Um, you know, I, I tell you what, we're going to take a little walk down memory lane here, and what a freaking horror show at the very beginning, to be totally honest, right? You know, I think it's something that folks that are familiar with the industry, they can appreciate, they understand it. You know, they understand the trials and the tribulations and you know, you're dealing with things from early stage contamination all the way to leakers that were taking place after we got the contamination solved, then all of a sudden we would see, see leakers. But I got started um, you know, initially by consulting with Open Vape, who was the pioneer when it came down to oil cartridges and concentrates. And so Open Vape, based out of Denver, Colorado, um, they were the pioneers. And so I got involved with him consulting first, and then later I became a, a CEO for a couple of years for them and helped transition the company. And it was really interesting. One of the first things that we realized was the challenges that were associated with the hardware. I thought, oh, the science behind the extraction, that's where the challenge is going to be. And then we're just going to have this little delivery thing called a, a vape pen. And it turned out to be a real shit show for a while. It did, you know, pardon the pun. But anyway, we, we ended up uh, realizing w there was a lot of challenges that were associated with the pen. So if you can imagine in 2012, 2012, when we were first trying to migrate from a real simplistic uh, e-cig, we went over to China and we have a lot of contacts over in China because of our previous businesses, our previous experiences, our careers. And so we went over to China just to see what was going on, how these things were manufactured. I swear to God, Tony, I about had a heart attack. I mean, I couldn't believe it. What did I mean, you find out? What did you come oh, across? Oh God, I tell you. So it was so dirty. It was so filthy, you know, and, and bless their hearts. What they were doing is they were, you know, manufacturing a product for already what was considered a rather dirty industry, you know, cigarettes. And so they weren't taking it very seriously and there wasn't any uh, regulations, right? <clears throat> and so you can picture uh, a, a place, a real cheap warehouse that was really, really rudimentary. It was very dirty. It was very low cost. And what I saw as you'll get, we'll get into the actual uh, makeup of, a, of a, what a cartridge is, the actual components. But one of the key ingredients of the early stage 
cartridges was the actual wicking. It's the wick. The wick would actually grab the oil, hold on to it, while then it was heated, and then it would vaporize, and, and the person could ingest it at that time. Well, I looked at this drum, this 55-gallon drum, and it had all of these cotton fibers you know, it was, it was just basically denim jeans that had been shredded, and that's what they were using for wick. Oh, and I thought, wow. oh, my God, that cannot be good for people, you know, and I thought, Jesus. So that's when the journey began for us to say, this is not good. We need to do something for the industry. We need to get this technology changed. And that's what started the roadmap. And the roadmap has been quite the journey. And David has been a real leader in this area. He has come up with some ingenious ideas. We have found a partner that we can work with. At our direction, we laid out a clean room manufacturing. But we just went straight from a warehouse to an actual class 10,000 clean room in which our cartridges were and are today being manufactured in. So we're really proud of that. So Is there, got, are there many, are, are in many of the factories over there, are they all doing the same? Are they adapting to this right now or are they I still think in they the old, are. old age? I, I mean, I think you got a mixed bag. I mean, there's a lot of small scale manufacturers and they're really focused on the cost, right? And so they're still doing things in the in the old rudimentary fashion. But you've got some big guys now. Uh, you know, for example, the company that we work with, they're a subcontract manufacturer for us. So they do what we ask them to do, basically. And so they're they're kind of the leader when it came down to the clean room environment. And we did tour this last time we visited uh, just a couple of years ago, um, or was it last year? Anyway, when we visited, they, uh, there were a, a couple of other factories that were actually mimicking the success of the group that we work with. And so with all that said, um, I'm so excited to say that our next step is to actually bring that manufacturing into the United States. Uh, we've got a facility that's that's set up. We've got a facility that's targeted, a location, and we're working out the details right now and getting the proper funding in place to allow us to do that. We think it's going to be huge to be able to stamp made in the USA and be proud of it. Is there anybody create manufacturing those in the U.S. right now? Not to my knowledge. I think there might be some people that are doing some piece part assembly, but maybe not just the total manufacturing. I don't know, David, do you, are you aware of any? Um, there's a few groups that are definitely working on it, um, at, 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 like we are, um, and probably not too far away. Um, so the, the, there'll be a, a, just, a, just a couple groups that are able to actually uh, facilitate this. David, where did you start at in the industry with the cartridge? What's, what's a little bit of background on how you got into the industry? Yeah, um, I got started straight out of uh, college, uh, uh, started um, in Credit Pen, um, my own brand. Uh, we were importing and redistributing um, e-cigarettes, and I joined up with uh, a large uh, brand name in the cannabis industry um, uh, known as Open Vape, and there I became the product development manager. I uh, have a have a few patents to my name uh, for some uh, cartridge designs and um, and and battery designs. Um, so and, you were actually working with the factories over in China uh, mm -hmm. to develop these different products. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, hands on and and made several trips over there uh, to to uh, visit our factory floor and. Um, uh, f facilitate the, the relationships. So you understand it pretty in the insides and outs when you're working with China, how do you yeah, he see actually, David actually speaks Mandarin. So that helps. Oh, that's <laughs> just, just a little bit <laughs> <laughs> enough to get by, huh? <laughs> just enough, <laughs> just enough to get his way. Right. <laughs> So, so the, I mean, there's a ton of people here in these states that are buying these cartridges and they have for been for a long time. What would you tell somebody that uh, was purchasing from China and never actually visited a factory? Are they getting what they're supposed to be getting or is there a lot to worry about? Um, it, you know, there's a lot like, 
like Gary said, there's a lot of um, assembly houses um, that are just grabbing parts as they can and, and assembling in, in really poor environments. And um, a lot of that enters into Alibaba. And I think um, a, a lot of people are here in the United States uh, uh, find relationships through that uh, avenue. And it's just, um, it, it's unknown. There, there's a lot of uh, unknowns in doing that. And you really have to spend a lot of time procuring a, a good relationship with a quality manufacturer. We, and, you know, for those of you who don't know, if you're not familiar with Alibaba, basically that's the Amazon of Asia from what I, from what I understand. So uh, you can buy thousands of different hardware parts there if you're not familiar. Mm -hmm. And I actually remember uh, this was, they were buying them 10 years ago. Um, so with, with that information, I don't want to go too far else into, let's get into the history of the vaporizer and, and how we can do that. Gary, you know, what were some of the major problems you experienced? I know you've got some stuff you're going to show us. So, uh, you know, I'll open it up from there and, and, and let you start. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, around 2012, when I was first uh, introduced uh, to the industry and to the ancillary devices, the hardware that we call it, uh, we recognized that the design of the e-cigs or, I'm mean, sorry, for the cartridges actually came out of the e-cig world. And so we quickly realized that there was a challenge going into uh, supporting cannabis, right? Because there were, there were different parameters. One of the key parameters is viscosity, right? How thick the oil is. And so there's a wide range of different viscosities, even in the cannabis realm. But one of the things that we realized with the hardware, and, and David can probably show you one of these original um, uh, designs, uh, is is that it was plastic. It was made out of plastic, which, you know, traditionally speaking and, and currently there isn't anything wrong with plastic but this particular grade of plastic was pretty pretty lower grade okay and then also it had the the wicks that i, I mentioned the, the cotton wicks um there was contamination that was in the atomizer and in a minute here we'll have david show that the atomizer is where the the oil is 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 transferred to the heating element into the heating from the heating element it turns into vape and that's what is ingested it turns into vape and that's what is ingested by by the user so david if you want you can hold up one of those original cartridges if you have one handy um I, this is this is one of the original cartridges i mean very familiar looking um so for for those it, of you, you guys out there that. so that's that's a plastic cartridge um so it's got a black, let me hold it up again, David. Sure. So it's got a black uh, mouthpiece. It's got a clear center part where uh, the, the, it's uh, empty. So that's where you fill the oil. And then it's got a, on the bottom of that, it's got a uh, metal piece with threads that threads onto the actual battery itself, right? Correct, yes. And, and in here is the atomizer. So this is the heating element. In the um, metal part, okay. And so what, what's inside of here, I'll show you, is um, if you can see this. So there, there those is like a, heat, Those are like heating elements, it looks like. So he just right. unscrewed so, the bottom. So in, in the very, yeah, so this is that, that bottom uh, thread piece. And okay. I, and, and that's removed uh, from the plastic. Uh, so would you say those are like heating elements, kind of like what you would see that you use for an electric burner on a stove, somewhat like that, just stretched out and, and elongated, right? Um, these, these are, this is a, a heating element that is more like a, uh, uh, it's a coil, um, a coil, that okay. is wrapped. So in, in the early, uh, uh, very original designs, um, as Gary was talking about, uh, there, there are plastic cartridges. Um, the heating element was a, uh, coil, um, wrapped around a wick. And there, there's also a wick, um, going up into the cartridge itself that would, you know, draw the oil into this heating element. Okay. And this heating element is um, a coil, again, wrapped around a wick and often cotton or uh, a silica is, it w w was used in, in the very beginning as well. And, um, and what, was, uh, what, what needed to happen in these early designs is um, b because the oil 
wouldn't really retain in, in the wick. Um, it, it would actually fill this reservoir and you actually had to have uh, this nickel uh, mesh. Um, if you can kind of see that kind of bordering so the, this, bordering the this, outside of the elements. Okay. Yeah. The bordering the outside of the heating element. And that was just to try to kind of retain as much oil back as, as possible because it would inevitably just uh, uh, leak on you. Um, so yeah, that that's, that's the inside of the original uh, design there. So what were, what are the major defaults that you see uh, in that original design that you've uncovered over the years that uh, and to fix problems on that original design um yeah so uh, again the 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 cotton and and the wick um itself uh we, we discovered that the capillary action is necessary to dry in the oil for that uh vapor uh for, for the oil to get drawn into the heating element so it can then get vaporized and then displaced and so um, we realized that with, with oils, uh, most oils, that we didn't even need to have a wick to facilitate that capillary action. So um, that, that was one thing. And then because we just wanted to eliminate that material altogether. And what that really uh, ultimately led us down was uh, uh, looking into the technology of, of co-fired uh, ceramics. Um, and, and Gary can definitely speak, speak to that. Gary, yeah. I want to, I want to ask you one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when he was talking about the nickel elements around, yeah, because yeah, you were, yeah. you were trying to hold the oil back from leaking out. Is that correct? Is that correct? Where, okay. Correct. How many hundreds of thousands of dollars were wasted in that time when you, when you, you were learning this process? Oh my company? God. You know, I, I'd be embarrassed to tell you, but uh, <laughs> you know, if you if you take a look at, the, not only are are you, uh, let, let's say the failure rate was as high as twenty to twenty five percent. If the failure rate was per cartridge per per lot, right? If the failure rate was down around three or four percent, we'd celebrate. In statistical process control, that's unheard of. That's that's shameful. It absolutely is. So what we're, our goal was to get down to zero defects, right? And so if you take a look at the design that David has, that was actually an improvement from the original design when we started to add certain features that he just outlined there. But the the challenge there was that we added cost and the consumers weren't willing to pay for it, right? So what we ended up doing is living with that reject rate being really high, and then they would turn into leakers in the fields, and there was agreements with the uh, dispensaries to actually take the leakers back from the customers, give them uh, new cartridges, and hope to hell that they worked okay. And then what ends up happening is, is that residual oil, you have to dispose of that. You know, you have, you can't repurpose it. Right. And so it's because it's a very expensive deal when you, when you have failures, it really is. So, so the move to the co-fire technology was huge. So what do you do and, with those old cartridges with the oil? Then? Oh, they had to be disposed of. So the oil had to be removed. The oil had to be disposed and the cartridge had to be disposed of separately. So there's mm -hmm. an additional cost that's associated with that. Because every every gram of oil has to be accounted for. Wow! So I can imagine people that are starting to do this right now. They're going they well. Even, no. Yeah, yeah, and and what you don't want to do is get caught cutting corners because then that becomes really expensive because you're out of business, you know, or you're you're actually put on quarantine for a period of time. Uh, so you got to follow the rules. And so that's what we did. So it was a drive to get down to zero defects. And the, so the first round of the co-fire technology, what it is, is you're basically taking ceramic, you're taking ceramic in a green state, they call it. It's a green state. It's before it's fired into a hard state. It's green state. So you take a ceramic soft, it's soft, and you deposit metal. That's going to be the conductor, the heat conductors. And you deposit the metal into the soft ceramic and then you fire it together at a very, very high temperature. So like kiln, like you're, you're, you're heating it up to harden it. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Exactly. And so we would do that uh, separately. And so that would 
create our heating element. That heating element then would go into that atomizer that David showed you. So the challenge with that was, once again, it was more expensive than what the market would bear. And so we had, to, we really tried to evangelize the fact that uh, quality sometimes can be free. <laughs> so if we put in the right quality system, you're going to forego and you're going to pay a little bit more for it. You're going to pay a little bit more for that technology, but your reject rate is going to go down significantly. So that was, that was a real big breakthrough for us. And, and David took the concept. I had the concept from an earlier previous life in the integrated circuits world. And David took that concept and worked with our partners in, uh, in China, actually, uh, to make that manufacturable. So it wasn't an easy feat, but they did it. Hey, everyone. Sorry, that's all we have time for this week. Please come join us next week in our episode as we talk with Gary and David about coal fire cartridge and how that's going to change the way you vape. I can't wait for you guys to come back. Please check us out at extractionessentials.com and we will see you next week. Thanks so much for joining us. You have just listened to another informative episode of Extraction Essentials with Tony Frischknit. We invite you to come back next time as we strive to provide useful knowledge and tools every week to help you on your extraction business. You can also visit extractionessentials.com for additional resources and to know more about working with Tony. See you again next time.